this is a little overview of the things that we talked about in class today. Most of it referred to or related back to this column on this sheet, so I'm trying to help you understand what these numbers mean, our letters and numbers. So to begin with, if we drew a picture of a molecule CH4, we would add our valence electrons, 4, and then hydrogen has 1, so 1 times 4 is 4, so our total number of molecules here would be 8 molecules. Eight, excuse me, total number of electrons would be 8 electrons. Then we draw our skeleton structure, looks like this, put the H's around it, and we would have eight electrons in our picture already, so eight minus eight is zero, and there wouldn't be any lone pair electrons in this molecule. If we actually put the, instead of using a line like this, sometimes we, we show the electrons using this kind of notation where we have one electron from the carbon. So we'll put one, because carbon has four, remember? And then each hydrogen had one electron. So we could have the H with one electron, and the H with one electron, the H with one electron, and the H with one electron. So that would give us our eight electrons. This time you see them as pairs instead of as lines. This line and this pair is the same thing. Notice that in this pair, that one comes from the hydrogen and one comes from the carbon. The pink from the hydrogen, the blue from the carbon. Over here, we don't show, we just show two electrons. We don't show where they, where they came from, which, from which one atom donated which one, each one. But we do know, we learned that these guys all repel each other. And so they become equidistant from each other. And these angles are 90 degrees, but in real life, it moves into this kind of a shape with a three-dimensional arrangement, so the angles can be greater than 90 degrees. Like here we are, four domains, tetrahedral, four shared, no unshared. The angles are actually 109.5 degrees. And the molecule looks like this. You see those, it goes into a three-dimensional shape, which is called a tetrahedron. And the reason it's called a tetrahedron is because there's a side, imaginary side, from here down to those two, another one from here down to these two, and a third one from here to these, these two, and then on the bottom, there's still another imaginary side. So there are four imaginary sides. A four-sided, three-dimensional figure is called a tetrahedron, and that's why this word is tetrahedral configuration. All right, so this is what happens. Now, the, the thing that today's class was about is how do we explain that? Because if you look at the dot diagram for a normal carbon atom, it would be trying to show the electrons in a 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 configuration because carbon has, of course, six valence or six electrons. Of those six, four of them are valence electrons. So if we drew the normal valence electron picture, picture we would have the, these two right here would be in the s sublevel, and then the 2p electrons would be in separate orbitals. Remember, they go into orbitals one at a time. So we'd have one here and one here. So this picture doesn't seem to support this picture because this shows the electrons all spaced out evenly. So if I have my hydrogen come in on the bottom, like this hydrogen is, have my electron there, where's the other electron? What's well, over here, but how does it get over here? And that's what hybridization is about. So now we're gonna take a little video uh, tour of what hybridization might look like in different um, molecules. And we go to my website, you go to your homework page. And we'll skip Riley. the ad here in a minute. Riley. Chemists use valence bond theory and especially the concept of orbital hybrid number of atomic orbitals that so the first hybrid hybrid type of hybridization that we're going to talk about is SP hybridization. So that goes back to this geometry chart. Let me just open this up on a separate tab here. 
So we're looking at SP hybridization and what is involved in that. This is taking a minute to load in. Here we go. So SP right here. So what, is, what does that mean? So here we go. Mix always equals the number of hybrid orbitals that form. Here, two different atomic orbitals, one 2s right and one 2p, one. mix mathematically to become two identical sp hybrid orbitals, each with one larger and one smaller lobe. So sometimes we call this a lopsided dumbbell, where you got a big side and a small side. Two orbitals, these are sp hybrid orbitals because we combined one s orbital and one p orbital. The two orbitals face in opposite directions in the atom. For clarity, we'll show hybrid orbitals in this simplified form. First, we'll use box diagrams to depict hybridization and consider the central beryllium atom in the linear molecule BeCl2. The isolated Be atom has filled 2s orbital and 3 empty 2p orbitals. In the process of hybridization, the 2s and one of the 2p's mix and form 2sp hybrid orbitals. The two electrons from the 2s become distributed into the sp orbitals. One Notice that the orbital is higher in energy. Each one of these hybrids is higher in energy than the 2s was, but not quite as high energy as the 2p. One electron each with parallel spin. The two other 2p orbitals remain empty and unhybridized. Here is the same process in a box diagram that shows orbital shapes. Putting these ideas together, we can imagine the hybridization process for BeCl2 is something like this. The isolated beryllium atom, with its filled 2s and empty 2ps, is shown with the small box diagram above. The chlorines have three 3p orbitals, but will fade out the ones that are not involved in bonding. In the molecule, beryllium has undergone sp hybridization. The half-filled sp hybrid orbitals overlap the half-filled chlorine orbitals. Notice the pair of electrons that formed here. The chlorine joined the beryllium. This is a hybrid orbital bonded to a normal p orbital. Any type of straight-on overlap like this, where the, uh, you got a direct end-to-end, end-to-end overlap, is called a sigma bond, and it'll come up later. All right, here we go to form two BeCl covalent bonds that are 180 degrees apart. From here on, we'll show electrons within orbitals as dots. So when it says 180 degrees apart, and remember that the sp hybrid orbitals were straight line molecules, linear, 180 degrees. And 180 degrees means between here and here is 180 degrees. To account for molecules with a trigonal planar shape, such as boron trifluoride, the model proposes that the ground state boron atom undergoes sp2 hybridization. The filled 2s of the central boron mixes with one half-filled and one empty 2p to become three half-filled sp2 hybrid orbitals. So we're saying that this orbital and these two orbitals blend together and mix up. Um, hybrid, of course, means blending, like a hybrid car is a blended auto, uh, gas and electric. This is a blended orbital where we're combining the S and then two Ps to make an SP2 hybrid system. They are all equivalent in energy, higher in energy than the 2S, but lower in energy than the 2P. Boron's third 2P remains empty and unhybridized. Here's an orbital depiction of the ground state boron with filled 2s, half filled 2p, and two empty 2p's. The fluorines have half filled 2p orbitals. In BF3, the boron atom is hybridized with the three sp2 hybrids pointing to the corners of an equilateral triangle. And we call that, since it's pointing to the corners of a triangle, we call it trigonal pyramidal or trigonal pyramidal. It's right here. Uh, excuse me, I've said pyramidal, I meant to say planar. So trigonal planar or trigonal planar right here. Because it's a triangle and it's in a plane. 
when you see the plane here, it's just flat. Boron and fluorine orbitals overlap to form three BF bonds 120 degrees apart. To account for the millions of molecules with tetrahedral shapes, the model proposes that the central atom undergoes sp3 hybridization. This one is the most common. When he said millions, he means millions. And most of, of our bodies are, are composed of molecules which have this type of hybridization. Um, so which is really, really common in organic chemistry. And we're, we're a carbon-based life form, so around carbon it's very common to get four domains. For example, in the carbon of methane, the filled 2S, two half-filled 2Ps, and empty 2P mix and become four half-filled sp3 hybrid orbitals. The model describes bonding in methane this way. In the molecule, the carbon's four sp3 hybrid orbitals point to the corners of a tetrahedron. The h orbitals overlap them to form four CH bonds that are 109.5 degrees apart. So now we're looking back at the beginning of the video. Remember we had this molecule. So this, these are all 109.5 degrees. They go into three dimensions because you can get further than 90 degrees and electrons repel each other. So, you know, these guys are going to repel these guys. So a tetrahedral configuration, we explain the discrepancy. We, had, we, we really have a hard time rationalizing how this can become this unless we come up with the concept of hybridization, that the S and the P's blend. And when they blend, they turn into this kind of an arrangement where everything is equidistant. Now, of course, this would be in three dimensions instead of two dimensions, but the idea is that they get as far apart as possible. For other shapes within a given electron group arrangement, the model proposes lone pairs in one or more of the hybrid orbitals. So we're going to look at For ammonia example, in H3. The trigonal pyramidal shape of ammonia arises when the 2s and the three 2ps of the central nitrogen mix and become four sp3 hybrid orbitals, one which is filled with a lone pair. Here, we visualize the nitrogen atom undergoing sp3 hybridization. One of the tetrahedrally oriented sp3 hybrids is filled with a lone pair, and the H atoms overlap the other three to form three NH bonds. Remember, we talked about an unshared pair being a domain, and then we have three shared pairs that are a domain. So this has still four domains, but one of the domains is an unshared pair. In the case of water, with its V shape, the model proposes a situation similar to that for ammonia. The 2s orbital of the central O atom mixes with its three 2ps and becomes four sp3 hybrids. But now, two I want to mention that these two electrons and these two electrons will become the lone pairs that we see in just a minute. So there'll be two lone pairs on a water molecule. These are the, going to be the lone pairs, and these are going to be the, the electrons that are in the bonds with hydrogen. Two of the hybrid orbitals are filled with lone pairs. In the water molecule, the oxygen has undergone sp3 hybridization. Two of the sp3 orbitals are filled with lone pairs, and the H atoms overlap the other two. So remember these two lone pairs. That's this pair and this pair, and then these are going to be the bonds right here to form two OH bonds. Carbon is most commonly at the center of a tetrahedral grouping of single bonded atoms. But it also occurs at the center of a trigonal planar grouping that includes a double bond. So now we're going to take a minute to just look at what a double bond consists of. It has one hybrid orbital and one that's not hybrid. So it's kind of a weird situation. This is called a uh, sigma and a pi bond. Uh, we'll see what it looks like in just a second. Consider the carbon-carbon double bond in ethylene. Valence bond theory proposes that each carbon undergoes sp2 hybridization. Its filled 2s and two half-filled 2ps mix to become three half-filled sp2 hybrids, and the fourth electron occupies the unhybridized 2p. 
Let's examine the orbital view and highlight the two ways carbon orbitals overlap to create a double bond. Here, each carbon is undergoing sp2 hybridization. Note how the unhybridized 2p orbitals lie perpendicular to the trigonal plane of sp2 hybrids. The two sp2 orbitals facing each other overlap end to end. The bond they form is called a sigma bond. It is symmetrical along an imaginary line between the nuclei and is not weakened by the rotation of one atom with respect to the other. Now, focus on the two parallel 2p orbitals. By substituting accurate representations of 2p orbitals, you see that they can easily overlap side to side. This results in a pi bond, one that is not symmetrical along the line between the nuclei. Most importantly, it is weakened and in fact breaks by rotation of one atom with respect to the other. Thus, a double bond consists of one sigma and one pi bond. In the ethylene molecule, four H atoms overlap the four other carbon sp2 orbitals. So it's important to note here that we have one, two, three hybrid orbitals. This and this. So the bottom of this down here where it says pi bond and these two dots up here, they make together one bond. So there's a total, it looks like there are three bonds here, but there's not. There are only two bonds. This is one of them, the sigma bond, and this side-by-side -side p orbital overlap is called a pi bond. Recall that in molecules with more than four atoms around the... Now we're going to expanded octets. Expanded octets require a D sublevel. Central atom, such as phosphorus pentachloride, the central atom utilizes D orbitals to expand its valence level. Hybridization accounts for the shapes of these molecules as well. In the ground state, phosphorus has a filled 3s orbital, 3 half filled 3ps, and 5 empty 3ds. In PCL5, the 3s all the 3p's and one of the 5 3d orbitals mix to form five half-filled sp3d hybrid orbitals. So five domains is going to result in 10 electrons around the center atom. The other four 3d orbitals These remain be, empty and unhybridized. Empty. Here is the ground state phosphorus atom with the four 3d orbitals that remain unhybridized omitted. So notice that this orbital, these three, and this one are going to make five equivalent orbitals. For easier viewing. We'll move back to see the hybridized P atom in PCL5. The five sp3d hybrid orbitals point toward the corners of a trigonal bipyramid and half-filled 3p orbitals from five chlorines overlap them. Sulfur also has an excised P atom in PCL5. The, the five sp3d hybrid orbitals point toward the corners of a trigonal bipyramid and okay, so, well, half-filled 3p orbitals from Stop five. There. Okay, so here, see how you got the corners here? This is a, a triangle plane in this plane where I'm tracing these lines. That's a triangle in a plane. And then a, there's a peak up here and a peak down below. So if I put a an imaginary line from here to here and from here to here and from here to here. You see how I made a triangle right there? Okay, and there's three of those sides like that on top. So it makes a pyramid. And there are three of them on the bottom. So it makes a pyramid on the bottom. And so you end up with what's called a trigonal bipyramidal. Five chlorines. Oh. And that looks like, that's what, the, that's, that's what this one looks like, trigonal bipyramidal. And the hybridization is SP3D, SP3D. So this little chart tells you what the hybridization is. This little video is hopefully putting an image in your head that uh, helps you understand what these shapes look like. Overlap them. Sulfur also has an expanded valence level in many of its compounds. In the ground state, it has a filled 3s orbital, one filled and two half-filled 3ps, and five empty 3ds. It's important to note while we're talking about this that on the, you can't have expanded octets until you get to the third series. See, so the second series doesn't have a D sublevel. So in the second energy level, 
there's no D sublevel. So you wouldn't expect nitrogen, for example, or carbon to expand its octet and be able to have more than eight electrons. But the elements in the third series and beyond, they have a D sublevel that's available. It's empty, but it's still there. So it's possible for the octet to expand. And that's how we come up with this expanded octet idea. In the octahedral molecule sulfur hexafluoride, the 3s, all of the 3p, and two of the five 3d orbitals of the central s mix so to form up six, six half-filled sp3 d2 hybrid orbitals. The three unhybridized 3d orbitals remain empty. Here you see the isolated sulfur with 3s, 3p, and the two 3d orbitals that will become hybridized. In SF6, the six sp3d2 hybrid orbitals point to the corners of an octahedron, and half-filled 2p orbitals of six fluorines have overlapped them. So you can see the octahedron here. You have a, a plane, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, so it's a, a square plane. Then there's a up here there's a uh, domain and down here there's a domain so if I make a little triangle on it right there's a side that's one here's another two sides here's another three sides here's another four sides there are four sides on top four sides on the bottom and that's where we get the name octahedron so I'm hoping that this little video has helped you understand what these symbols mean when we talk about hybridization so this weekend, you should be able to complete all of your dot diagrams over uh, until you get to uh, the column that deals with polarity and formal charge. So you leave those blank, but everything else you should be able to complete. So uh, be sure you focus on that this weekend before Tuesday.